Good morning. Good morning if you're in Europe or the UK. Good afternoon if you're further east and good evening if you're joining us from elsewhere in the world. I see we have some people joining us from Taiwan. Uh, Patreon, great to have you with us. Looking forward to uh, a great discussion today. And we've got uh, a number of sessions, five sessions today as part of the OEB Digital Day. Looking forward to sharing thoughts with you. My name's Donald Taylor. And in a minute, I'll start with my slides and my opening presentation for the day. But I just want to let you know what else is coming up uh, at 9.30 UK time, uh, 10.30 European time. We have the future of business education. Following that, we've got moving towards transforming the learner and institutional success. Online proctoring is our fourth session today. And we wrap up with Jilly Salmon at 2 p.m. UK time, 3 p.m. European time, becoming an online human and dodging the robots. I love that title. So we've got five great sessions, well, four great sessions today and one from me. Uh, the last thing I'll say before we kick off is don't forget that Online Educator Berlin OEB is running in November and you can submit your talk to be considered for inclusion. So please, if you are interested in speaking, go to the website and the link will come in at the end of this presentation. Go to the website and have a look at submitting a talk yourself. We've got a great bunch of people all over the world and it'd be great to have you bringing your experience to the event in Berlin. Right, that's enough setting the scene. Time for me to begin with my actual presentation for the day. So as I say, my name is Donald Taylor and I am the chairman of the Learning Technologies Conference in London. That's part of the uh, family of conferences, which includes OEB. And every year I do a survey which looks at the sentiment of people in learning and development. And there we are, we've got a link going to the chat already, looking at the, uh, giving you the link through to the conference. My survey each year, looks at what people are thinking about learning and development and what's happening. And I'm going to share with you some of the key results we've got from that this year. It's very interesting looking at what the world is thinking and feeling about this year, especially as we come out of COVID. The, the summary, the summary of it is that COVID has done two things for us. First, it's made life very difficult because we have to do things with less budget, we have to do more. But also it's created a world of opportunity. Suddenly there are people wanting skills out there from elsewhere in the organization. And it's that contrast between the demand from the business and the reality of the difficulty of budgets and engagement and getting stakeholders enthusiastic that I want to look at in the course of this presentation. And I hope that will set us up for the rest of the day with the OEB Digital Day. Firstly, I just want to say a big thank you to our survey sponsors that make it possible, and of course, the media partners, and of course, the uh, work of OEB in this, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, fabulous in also supporting getting the outreach to get people to reply to the survey. Here are the five things I want to look at. We'll have to look at the results for this year, then we'll drill down in a bit more detail. I want to look at the what I think is the, the the two core things here, the challenge and the change and the why and the how. So the challenge is we have to overcome issues. And then the why and the how is about shifting us back from the stuff we do day to day to the bigger picture. Let's begin by having a look at the results for the survey for this year. Now, every year for the past nine years, in December and January, I have asked the same form of question to people, what would be hot in workplace learning and development in the following year, 2022? And um, we have a good evening to, I think it's Raina coming us from Australia. Thank you so much for joining us from down under. Great to have you with us. Um, and we had a great showing, by the way, in the survey from Australia. We have three and a half, more than three and a half thousand voters this year from 112 countries. And they are fascinating in their breadth. 92% of the uh, results come from these seven areas. The good news was we got great response from Africa this year. Bad news is we were still light in Asia. That will be what we tackle next year in our 10th year. So this is the question we ask. 
that's where the votes come in from. Before I go any further, I just want to raise a caveat. <clears throat> you might have noticed that if we're asking people, as we do, by email and social media to respond to the survey, there's a problem. The problem is that it's a non-representative sample. So if you're familiar with this curve, the Everett Rogers Diffusion of Innovation curve, you'll know that we have people all over it. But the people who respond to the survey don't come from all over the curve. They come largely from the left-hand side. They come from the innovators and the early adopters. They're people who choose to respond. They are connected to and frequently using email and social media. And they have an opinion they want to share. So they're excited about technology and methodologies. So they're people who decide to join us and they are innovators and early adopters. But actually, that's exactly what I want, because in looking at the survey, what I'm always interested in is not really what's the hype, although we do look at that. The question for me is, what of all the things that people are talking about today will be popular and actually used three, four, five years in the future? So I'm interested in looking at these results that we'll look at now and wondering, all right, which of these things is going to move from being in the innovators and early adopters to being adopted by the early majority. And it might only be 10% of them, it might be more. But that's the fascinating thing. That's why I do the survey every year to find out what's hot. Another hello from Australia from Marie. Great to have you with us. Here are the 15 things that I ask people to choose from. I ask people to choose three things from the system 15, or they can choose other. I'm going to take a sip of water could you go to the chat while I'm having my sip of water and just let us know of these things, which is the one thing, the one thing that you think is going to be hot this year? Right, sorry about that. I had a bit of a coughing fit. I've been doing a lot of talking in the past <laughs> two weeks and my throat's got a bit dry. A lot of some answers coming in already. People are saying what they think is going to be hot uh, in the coming year. AI is always the first one because it's the quickest one to type. Reskilling uh, and upskilling getting quite a lot. Janine says curation. Veronique says reskilling. Um, Sylvia, reskilling, upskilling. All right. I'm going to <laughs> learning analytics, says Lisanne. Patreon says learning experience design, which we don't have on here, but that's fine. That's an other choice. Ashlyn, skills-based talent management. Please do keep your ideas coming. Please do keep chatting in the in this uh, chat area because uh, for me, getting the response and the conversation is is crucial to my understanding. Uh, it's never just a matter of one person me talking. It's always a matter of us collaborating together. So please do keep your thoughts coming. But let me share with you what the results for the world were. Here are the results. But I want to point out that although this is what the result of the survey is, it's not a matter of being right or wrong. You may have chosen something which is towards the bottom of this table. Oh, that's fine. One thing we're going to discover looking at these results is that Every region, every country, every company, every context is different. There's no right and wrong. There's just a question of what's right for you in your particular circumstances. It's a very important thing I want to stress there. Okay, so this is the set of results for three and a half thousand people in the world. And I just want to have a look at the very top of it and then have a look at some of the key things that I get from these results. Firstly, a lot of people have already been talking in the chat about reskilling and upskilling. That's great. I just want to remind us what reskilling and upskilling are because it's dominated the table this year it dominated it last year reskilling means you're getting you're in the same job you're getting you're going upwards you're getting new skill sorry reskilling is you're going sideways you're getting new skills for a different job maybe you're moving sideways maybe you're moving diagonally upskilling you're going up in the same job you're keeping the same job but you're enhancing and you're getting extra skills to keep going in that direction. So that's reskilling and upskilling, what I would define it as. Now, 
On the table, you can see it remains number one. It's down from last year by half a percent, but that's still a very, very strong vote, 12 and a half percent. It's the, the biggest vote we had for five years was last year, 13 percent. This is the second highest vote. So it's a very strong vote. I want to just look at what reskilling upskilling came from, because one of the one of the points in chat going past was reskilling upskilling or just skills in general, which I think is a really good point. Why are we using this term reskilling and upskilling and where does it come from? Is it just about training generally? Well, actually, perhaps it is. Um, let's have a look at it. The the idea of reskilling and upskilling really came into consciousness. If you look at Google Trends, it, it's a sort of a flat line, but then really picks up in January 2019. And initially, if you look at the left hand side of this slide, all the reports about reskilling and upskilling are all about the need to give people new skills because of automation and AI. So things are changing and we need to give people new skills. The pandemic hits in December 19, January 2020, and around April, the reports all changed to, oh, we need to change because of COVID. And so we need to give people new skills because they're going to be working a different way. Now, and then at the end of this year, 20, uh, sorry, the end of 2021, I'm looking for the results of my survey. And, uh, by this point, people have had two years of constant exposure to this term, reskilling and upskilling and if you just look at the reports that have come out there you you literally can't move well you can move but the words reskilling and upskilling are everywhere and that one there from the world economic forum in january 2020 particularly influential a lot of talk about the future of work and how we need to have new skills for it this sounds like this sounds like it's a buzz phrase that hasn't got any real meaning. I don't think that's the case. Having looked at it and thought about it a great deal, there are international, so European-wide, for example, initiatives. There are national initiatives, for example, in some countries in South America. There are company-wide initiatives. There are departmental initiatives, all of which are aimed at either reskilling, getting people to move horizontally, or upskilling, giving people new jobs where they are. They are real things that are really happening. The reasons are both automation and COVID. So it is a real thing. But then the question is, okay, it's a real thing. It's a big phrase that covers a lot of ground. So maybe that's why it's popular, but why do we choose it? My answer is we choose it because the words have been around for two plus years now of us listening to them. In fact, getting close to three years now. And that forms what I call the ambient wordscape. Now, if your first language isn't English, this is, this is a made up phrase of mine. But what I'm trying to do is convey the idea that around us on podcasts, radio, TV, blogs, printed material, there are all these words. And if we want to describe something, we don't invent something ourselves. The first thing we do is we choose something from the ambient wordscape and we're surrounded by something which just won't go away, like reskilling and upskilling, that's the word we choose for. So it's number one, and it reflects a reality. It reflects a reality of what we're doing, and we choose that word because literally everyone's talking about it, but it doesn't mean it's hype. Okay, so that's my take on reskilling and upskilling. One thing, though, worth noting is that it's not as dominant as it was last year. So he, uh, there are, I have the one obligatory question, what will be hot next year? And I have two optional questions, which one of which is where do you work? We'll look at the other one in a second. Now, these are, there are six categories I give people, but these are the four main categories. If you have a look at them, you'll see that reskilling, upskilling is number one, but not for education. We'll talk about education a little bit more later on, but you can see it puts reskilling, upskilling at number two. Also, reskilling and upskilling last year was dominant almost everywhere in the world. That's not quite the same this year. I've got a graph here of the top three options, but I've pushed back option two and option three. So we're just looking at the first option, reskilling and upskilling. You can see that all of the seven regions that we get our votes from, you can see that they are pretty close here. 
there's about two and a half percent difference between them. They're all voting for reskilling, upskilling to some extent, but they're not all putting it number one. So South America, for example, and Australia and New Zealand, it's very close. In fact, in South America, reskilling and upskilling is not number one. In New Zealand and Australia, it comes very close to overtaking it. So not every region is super uh, enthusiastic about the idea. So first summary point, reskilling, upskilling, for a number of reasons, is at number one, but it's not quite as strong as it was last year. I'd like now just to have a quick look at number two and number three. You look at these on the, on the graph, you can see that in collaboration, the blue one, is number two like it was last year personalization was four last year is number three this year but you can also see that the, the votes have changed more for collaboration this year less for personalization that gap between those two blue and orange is one and a half percent doesn't look very much and you might say they're very close but again it's different across regions let's go back to have a look at the regions and now i've pushed back reskilling upskilling you can see collaboration and personalization are uh, further forward. And you can see there's much more variation here than there was with reskilling and upskilling. There's much more difference in height between the bars. And you'll notice that although on the main table, there's a one and a half percent difference, in some regions, the differences are really, really big. In South America and in Africa, collaboration is way ahead, way ahead of personalization, 7.3, 6.3%, huge difference. Whereas in North America and India, it's the other way around, actually, personalization is preferred over collaboration by quite a large margin. What's going on here? It's very, very tempting to look for cultural explanations here. So, for example, you might say, well, look, South America, Brazil in particular, which dominates the voting there, South America is a much more collaborative society. North America is a much more individual, individualistic society. But uh, India is a much less individualistic society than North America, and yet it also puts personalization first. So I'm not sure that I have a simple explanation for this. I think it's a combination of cultural and other issues. It may be that with India here, for example, there's a sampling issue, and that I'm just simply sampling people who are very positive about technology. So that's one point about this. Firstly, the key thing here is that, yeah, personalization and collaboration are, are, are popular topics, but are seen very differently in different areas. I want to explore that for the moment. Here we have seven, or oh, sorry, six options uh, across four of the main regions, Europe, UK, North America, Africa, and these regions account for 72% of the vote. You can see with reskilling and upskilling at the top there, there's a fairly strong agreement about that. And we saw the bars didn't go up and down very much there for reskilling and upskilling. But for the other ones, we can see the votes are really spread out. There's a very strong difference of opinion. North America, as we've just seen, prefers personalization over collaboration. And in Africa, it's the other way around. Very strong vote for collaboration uh, rather than personalization. Africa is really interesting because the votes there are so very different from the other main regions. So very supportive of coaching and mentoring, much less so of learning analytics and micro learning. And you might say, well, OK, if, if that's something, if they feel less supportive of learning and analytics and, and micro learning, but they back coaching and mentoring, is that an anti-technology thing from Africa? But it isn't because in Africa, down the table, it's true, but down the table, the differences are really, really big for AI, VR, and mobile delivery. And, and you can see with mobile delivery, for example, that Africa is over 6%. And the next, the next most popular vote for it is from North America, which I think was 3.8%. So there's a huge difference there. And the rest, of the, op, the rest of the regions aren't even on that line for mobile delivery. They're so far off to the left-hand side. So Africa here is really supporting technology. So, um, yeah, it, now I, possibly, Defcan is saying it, 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 it is a cultural issue. Maybe it is. I'm always, I've, I've done this long enough 
and I've come up with enough explanations that I've had to later rethink about that I'm I'm always very wary of trying to give any single simple explanation. But I can say this. Um, here are uh, there are 15 countries which scored 90 with where 90 or more people voted and i've looked at of the key options which country voted the most for each of the particular options you can see here that south america for example voted very sorry south africa voted very strongly for mobile delivery now there there is a really strong local reason for it south africa is a huge country with a not very dense population, not much technical infrastructure. They're going straight to mobile delivery because it makes sense. So that makes perfect sense in, in South Africa. I was talking with somebody from Spain the other day and I was saying, well, look, Spain is the country that voted most strongly for learning analytics. And she just could not come up with any explanation for why Spain uh, would do. Uh, reskilling upskilling is the strongest in Sweden, which goes against everything we've had in the past on the survey. But I know the reason for that is because there was a book uh, put out in, in Sweden in uh, just a couple of months before the voting started by Pears Lager, which was called, I think, Upskill or Reskill. And it got a lot of voting. Now, uh, it got a lot of popularity and, and, and um, press. It, it, when something like that is in the air and people are talking about it, for me, that affects what I call the ambient wordscape. It's just that the words are in people's heads. And I think that swung the vote. So there are reasons sometimes you can point to for things being different in different places uh nadine i would i would love to i would love to think about that and it may be there's a difference in learning culture rather than social structure um they don't forget that people like um i don't know fons trompenars and um others have done great work on intercultural differences between between countries between countries and within companies, um, it is quite possible to identify cultural differences. Um, I am, as I say, wary of trying to make too simple a judgment about anything. All I'm saying then for all that we've just talked about is that location matters. This table tells us what the world, well, what three and a half thousand people in the world are thinking, but in each region, there will be local variations. And sometimes we can point to good reasons for that. Finally, I want to look at the top half of the table, well, down to number nine, and look at what's moving up and down. You might be tempted to say, look, we've got collaboration, coaching, consulting, moving up the table in the top half and coming down, personalization, learning analytics and learning experience platforms. And you might say that shows that this is the year that people are winning and technology is fading away. Again, I'm going to try to push against that and i i yes personalization is done with technology these days it doesn't have to be but the stuff that's going up here collaboration and coaching in particular not so much the consulting but collaboration and coaching are increasingly done with technological support in particular coaching and mentoring which came onto the table last uh, two years ago rose up last year rose up again this year uh, that is increasingly being supported by technology, either in administration or indeed in the coaching mentoring itself. So it's not so much that I think this is a people winning over technology. I think this is people working with technology. I do think there's something in the argument that we are looking for a more human way of doing things after COVID. I do. But I don't think that's at the exclusion of technology. By the way, thank you for all your comments and thoughts. Keep them coming in the chat. I do a lot of talking around the survey results. Over the years, I don't know how many times I've, I've explained them, but every time I do it, and we have Defken, so I can't quite read that properly, Defken, sorry, and uh, Nadine, coming up with ideas and other ideas that we've had in the chat, it provides tremendous value to me in further helping me understand things. So please do keep your comments coming. And of course, to everybody else in the room. Finally, I just want to point out that new this year, we had option six, skills-based talent management. We'll look at that later on. Um, in terms of the numbers for this year, that is exactly where you would expect a new option to come in the table. They tend to come in around number six with around 7% of the vote. Um, and then they go up. And I'll talk later on about what I expect to happen with skills-based talent management in the future. All right, time for a sip of coffee. And then let's have a closer look 
at the history of the survey and what, what happens typically over the course of five years. So here's a five year. I always love putting up the five year slide because I feel quite proud that having thought about this uh, nine years ago and got it running, we now have a survey that has got quite a lot of longitudinal data. I do try to improve it each year. The typical life of an option on the table goes like this. Firstly, it's not on 2018, then I put it on. And I try to find things which I think are um, people are talking about, which are popular, which are going to possibly go up the table in the future. So it comes on the table, it goes up, everyone's talking about it, we're excited about it, and then it starts dying away again. Most options on the table, because I will put on one or maybe two new options each year, most options are not going up, most options are coming down the table. That's the normal pattern of things. The question is, why are they coming down? And I think there's probably two different reasons. <clears throat> Sometimes you have something which is like learning analytics is interesting, but it's a bit difficult to make happen. And so people get excited about it, but then oh, not quite sure how to use it and maybe turn to something else. But sometimes, like with learning experience platforms, it's something interesting, which gets a lot of hype, a lot of interest, and then starts dying away because it's becoming adopted. And there's no doubt that Whereas learning experience platforms were the latest, newest thing in 2019, now they are really part of the landscape of learning and development. We just accept that they're there. So they're much less new than they were. And that's because they're being adopted, not because, like with learning analytics, they're just a bit difficult. So that's what normally happens. <clears throat> the arrows on the table, the main table, the ones, the green and, arrow, green and red ones going up and down, Show us what happens from one year to the next year. I'm not sure I'm going to put the arrows on next year because I think it's easy to misconstrue what they mean. But I do think taking a two-year perspective can be quite useful. Ah, now, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. I literally can't quite read the name Detken. Detken says, have you compared this to the Gartner hype cycle? It's exactly like the Gartner hype cycle. So let's just go back a second here. <clears throat> So with the Gartner hype cycle, you go up, you go down, and you come up again, and you start with a, a technology trigger, you go to the peak of inflated expectations, you come down to the trough of disillusionment, you make your way up the slope of enlightenment to the plateau of productivity. Um, it is, it's exactly like that. The difference is that I think there are, with this, I can point to different reasons why things are becoming popular and then becoming uh, less popular and then um, be possibly becoming popular again. Uh, I think I think there's a bit more nuance in my explanation around things, but it is effectively, yes, it is the Gartner hype cycle, absolutely. So thank you for raising that. The two-year perspective, I think, gives us a bit more of a view of not whether things are just moving up and down over one year. It gives us a sense of longer-term trend. So I want to look at <clears throat> the things which have really caught my eye and moved this year. Here we've got three options on their way down. 2020 for me was the year of data. I made a lot of talk about how the top five were really about how data supported what people were doing. But you can see that they've dropped those options by an average of more than 3% each over two years, which is a lot. In contrast, collaborative, social learning, and coaching and mentoring, as we saw earlier, they've gone up. They've not gone up just over one year. They've gone up over two years by an average of 1% each. Now, 1% doesn't sound like very much, but remember that generally options tend to come down the table. That's the first thing. Secondly, most of the votes, two thirds of the votes are always in the top half of the table. That's where most of the voting happens. So to make your way upstream, really, in the top half of the table is really quite difficult. So for these two options to go up is significant. And I'll have a look at that over the of course of what's happening. Now, Nadine points out, this is, of course, partly the influence of COVID. It's a huge influence of COVID. And the, the reskilling, upskilling part is, is, is absolutely part of it. I don't know that coaching and mentoring is entirely down to COVID. I think partly it is because of this reaction. People do want to get back to some sort of human touch. I don't think it's necessarily entirely that, because I've been tracking this since 2018, 
but I, I didn't put it on the table in 2018. And there's definitely been an increase in interest in the technological support of coaching mentoring. Collaboration and social learning absolutely was on a downward trend. And then when COVID struck, it hit an upward trend. So that's totally, totally a trend which we can attribute to, uh, not entirely, but I think the uptick is definitely down to COVID-19. All right. So I think the longer term perspective tells us that collaboration and coaching are definitely things to watch. I'm going to come back to that later on and look at it across work groups, and we'll learn something a bit new there. But I'd like just to have a quick look at skills-based talent management now, because I'm uh, excited by this. I'm also slightly worried about it. <laughs> I'll try to explain why. Skills-based talent management means trying to understand what people can do and then taking action on it. And that could be action to do with learning. It could be action to do with other things like recruitment externally, recruitment internally, placing people in jobs. In fact, it has a huge range of applications. So here's, here's the issue. In the past, we've had these things, tasks, skills, qualifications, experience none of which have really related to each other quite properly. There have been sort of loose connections between them. If you wanted somebody to do a job, you could look at their qualifications and it might give you an idea of how good they were at it, but it wouldn't give you all the information you needed. You wouldn't really know what their skills were. You couldn't really tell what somebody's experience left them able to do. Now, the promise of skills-based talent management is that it takes all of this stuff and using a combination of algorithms and AIs, put them into a common language so that it's possible to say, right, I, I can look at this person, I can know that they have this type of skill set and therefore they're able to do these things and I'll, make, I'll put them in to do this role or we want them to do this role, they're not quite ready for it, so we'll start training them for it. And it sounds ideal, in fact, there are people already using this very effectively for limited cases like smarter recruiting, like making sure in particular that the right project teams are put together. The promise is enormous. If you can say what skills somebody has, what skills a role requires, either their current role or a future one, and you can give them training to support the gap, then you are going to do some great things. My concern is that there is a lot of talk about being able to do this implicitly to implicitly understand people's skills by an AI or algorithm driven view of their activity online. That's possible up to a point, but I'm not sure how granular and how precise it can be. And my concern is that while there is good work being done here by some vendors, other people will jump into the space because it's going to be hot. There's no question about it. Other people will jump into the space and what will happen is the classic Gartner hype cycle, a, a huge overreach of expectation. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. And then we will plunge into the trough of disillusionment. I think it's a, it's a distinct possibility here. So skills-based talent management, I might be wrong. Watch it for the future. My, my <coughs> view is it's going to, going to be very popular. Will it be able to deliver on the promises? We'll see. Let's move on and have a look at the, I said there were two optional questions I asked. One was, where do you work? The other one was, what's your challenge for next year? That was the question I asked. Now, 40% of people answered. So I had a lot of reading to do. I, character, I went through everything and I put them into 16 different categories. But of those, these five categories accounted for two thirds of the answers. Budget was one of the problems for this year. Another one was stakeholder enthusiasm. Just going hybrid or staying hybrid, absolutely. Uh, implementation, just making things work technically was an issue. And also learner engagement. I want to share with you some of the quotes. It was a privilege to read this and get in touch with what people were actually doing. But it was also a little bit heartbreaking because some of the problems looked insuperable. Getting money and people for the department just seemed to be a huge problem for a lot of people. And it was particularly getting budget on the one side and on the other side, getting 
well-trained or skilled enough learning and development people. The second option there, I got a few times, the second line there, we see many newcomers who have chosen a totally new profession. In other words, people come into L&D, into a department who had no skills in it and no background whatsoever. And that was a real drag on learning and development departments that were trying to deliver. <clears throat> the, biggest, the biggest drag of all of them though, of, of all of the categories was engagement. This was the biggest challenge that people mentioned. And the phrases that came out over and over again were fatigue and disengagement. The shift to online working in general had meant that people were spending all their time in front of a computer. And as a result, they were very difficult to engage with online learning. <clears throat> the last point here really sums it up COVID has made everybody sick and tired of webinars and asynchronous learning. Now, my view is that people will always learn when they are motivated enough to do so. But I think we have two problems here. Firstly, people's motivation generally, not just for learning, has shrunk because it's been a very difficult two years. But also the mechanism itself and the amount they are engaged in the actual content has shrunk. So I think people are less inclined to want to learn online. Doesn't mean we can't do it, it just means the motivation has to be there. Let's come back to that. There's a bunch of stuff around technically getting this right, which has undoubtedly been an issue for learning and development, but in particular, people want to be able to tackle the hybrid issue. That was something that was coming through a lot. How do I make sure that when I'm going back to doing some stuff face-to-face, I can also look after the people who are online during a synchronous experience. That was a, a, a conundrum that came through a lot. The enthusiasm piece, sorry, the engagement piece, I think is answered by stakeholder enthusiasm. I think if leaders in the organization, managers can be brought on board and made to think that the learning programs are essential, <clears throat> then the result will be that <clears throat> you'll get the engagement from the learners. But people were struggling. People were struggling to find the ROI, the measures, the analytics, the data that they could take to their senior people and use to show that, in fact, they were doing great work and that the stakeholders should be enthusiastic about it. All right. There is something here that I want to share with you about, about the work groups, which ties back to this idea of stakeholder engagement. And I think this is, for me, looking underneath the surface data, the core of the result of the survey for me. First, I just want to point out that although collaboration came up on the table overall, the workplace cohort, that's 1,200 people, so that's over one third of the people involved in the survey, the workforce cohort didn't vote more for it than last year. Last year. In fact, they voted less than last year. The people who really supported it were the people in education. And that pushed the vote up because it was quite a substantial vote for collaboration. So it's not so much that collaboration is coming on strong. But if we go and focus on the workplace side of things, there's two things I want to look at here. Firstly, notice that collaboration, yes, is down and analytics is down, but up very strongly is, as we've seen, coaching and mentoring, but also personalization and reskilling. Now that tells me <clears throat> the people in learning and development want to focus on the individual's development. They want to reskill individuals, personalize it for them with coaching and mentoring and, and other mechanisms to ensure that that person is developing. Great. But look at the votes that are falling down the workplace learning and development side of things. Consulting with the business, showing value and performance support. Now, in my mind, you consult with the business to find out what the issue is. You do something, you show afterwards that you've delivered value <clears throat> and in the course of this you are helping improve the performance of people all of those three are down and that for me represents a contrast to the thing we've just seen about learning and development wanting to support individuals in other words i think workplace lnd is very focused on the individual less focused on the business need and i think that's a problem i think we are focused too much on the how 
who we should be supporting and less on the why. I said back in 2020, I'd said that data was dominating, but I don't think people necessarily were using the data to really look at the why. Why are we doing this? The, if we look at these three options, or look at these two options, consulting with the business and showing value over five years, you can see that apart from 2018, they've more or less been in the middle of the table and they've strayed not very far away from the same vote over that entire period. Now, there's a problem with this. If we are voting and being enthusiastic about individual development or about the latest shiny thing or whatever, we end up disconnected from the driving need of the business. And this is what happened last December. TikTok, or TikTok's owning company, ByteDance, dissolved its learning and development team completely, just, just got rid of it. Why? Well, they found that some people didn't know what the L&D department did. And this last paragraph here is, is really quite damning. Many learning events, such as online talks of mediocre quality with over a thousand people, didn't make very effective use of our employees' time. That's a pretty damning thing for anybody to say about their learning and development department. In other words, what happened was we had a, a, a well-funded, well-supported team of people that were out of sync with the business. Now, if that happens, then we end up, quite possibly, not just not having an influence, but being out of work. So when I think about data, as I thought about it in 2020, I think I was missing a trick. I think there was a focus on data, but I don't think there was enough focus on using that data properly. This is actually in the background there, the data from the survey. It's a bunch of lines in an Excel spreadsheet. It's a collection of ones and zeros. Data is, it looks like this, numbers and a color. If you interpret that, you might say, ah, right, okay, well, that is a geographical location. The red refers to something on that particular place. In this case, the traffic light on the westbound Talgarth Road is now red, which is a big road just close to my house. That information, if we add to it the context of my situation, we turn it into knowledge. What does it mean for me? Oh, well, it means that that traffic light that I'm going towards has turned red. But the insight is, oh, I need to stop the car. Now, <clears throat> this shift from data that I was talking about in 2020 towards insight is really rather crucial. We are probably liable to collect a lot of data in learning development with what we're doing. Are we turning it sufficiently fast into insight? I'm not sure we are. Some people are. Guy Wilmshurst-Smith is the head of network rail training in the UK. He's got a team of something like 600 people working for him, maintaining, and that's, that's training people, maintaining the infrastructure of the railways in the UK. And his clients are the railway companies that put trains on those tracks. He goes out and he has conversations with those people that we, <clears throat> he and I have agreed are data conversations. They talk about the data of the business doesn't talk about training. He doesn't talk about learning. He talks about the things that the people who run the railways are concerned about. And what they're concerned about is something called delay minutes. Every minute of delay on a bit of railway track has a financial implication for a train company. So he goes to them and says, right, if you look at this set of points, this bit of track here, if we get that team of yours to go through this training program, I can tell you, looking at my data, that within six months, you will have a reduction of your delay minutes by X percent, or words to that effect. In other words, he's very clear about showing a completely tangible link between a training activity and something they care about. Now, that's one example. There are lots of different ways in which he uses an analysis of what he's doing to show value to the organization. He goes from data to information, to knowledge, to insight. If you do this, then this will happen and it will benefit you. And I think for me, <clears throat> looking at the survey, that's the gap that we're missing is that gap from consulting with the business and showing value to, well, it's not a gap, it's just that there isn't enough emphasis on that, not nearly enough 
for us to be in the position we need to be in. I said at the beginning, COVID had given us a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge is that more people need training and that uh, it's a difficult position to be in. Uh, the opportunity is that more than ever, people higher up in the organization are ready to talk about this, but they're not going to talk about it in terms of training activity. They're going to talk about it in terms of the outcomes, the sort of thing that Guy talks about, delay minutes. I like to think about this as a journey that we have to take in order to influence people higher in the organization. And I look at it this way. We are walking up a mountain. And when you walk up a mountain, you have boots. Maybe you've got a stick to help you. And we have to do the day job. We have to look after skills now. We have to look after the onboarding. We have to look after the mandatory training. We have to just make sure people have the skills for their jobs. We can build skills for the future, make sure that we do capability building, for example. But if we want to go up to influence people high in the organization, the boots and the stick that we have on our walk won't necessarily help us. We have to go through that journey. We have to do these things because we have to show that we are competent L&D professionals. But when it comes to influence, we need an additional set of tools as well as everything we've done. We need to be able to have strategic conversations. We need to know about the business and its external environment. We need to be able to listen and understand what people are talking about when they discuss the, for example, EBITDA, return ratio, the AMM of the organization. All those acronyms need to make sense to us and we need to be able to engage in a sensible conversation around them. It's almost as if the boots and the stick that we have need to be replaced. We need new skills, maybe crampons, maybe an ice axe to get ourselves up into influence. And I think my plea to you would be, if you want to get to the stage of being, of, of taking the opportunity that COVID has provided us, which is people want to talk about skills, to really take advantage of that, we have to be more knowledgeable about the business, more capable of having great conversations with people in the business about it. What got us to the snow line, what gets us to the point of doing that job, doesn't enable us to go over it. We need new skills to get further. Let me wrap up and then I'm going to take uh, 10 minutes or so of questions and then we'll get on with the rest of the day. So my conclusion is that the overall results show what the world is thinking, but of course, don't forget that what matters to you in your context for your company is right. There's no right and wrong answers here. Collaborative learning and coaching and mentoring are ones to watch. Don't forget that coaching and mentoring is strongly backed by L&D, but actually collaborative learning was more backed by education than by workplace learning. Skills-based talent management, huge, huge promise. Will it deliver or will it go through the Gartner hype cycle? Most L&D practitioners, I think, are way too much focused on the how. Well, we have to do the how, but we need to use that as a building block to discussing the why with the people in the organization that write the checks. If we do that, then we tackle the business of stakeholder engagement. That enables us to engage, get our learners engaged. If we don't get stakeholders enthusiastic, we're never going to get past the real issues of stakeholder engagement that we face at the moment. Uh, if you want to register for your copy of the Global Sentiment Survey, then that's going to go live this afternoon. So please feel free to go to that URL um, and I'll just put it in the chat and that will enable you to go and, uh, as I say, register for it. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, I think it's at the bottom of, that, bottom of that page on the website. So I'm just putting that in the chat now. <coughs> and that's probably enough from me. I am very happy to <coughs> have another drink of water and look after any questions that you might throw at me in the questions and answers in the chat so please looking forward to your questions now as i have my sip of coffee and then water i think points out that there was a huge switch from face-to-face -face coaching and mentoring to online and i think that gave it a big push i think you're right i think undoubtedly uh, coaching and mentoring got a, a big lot of support from moving from what happened in COVID. Um, and the fact that it happened, the fact that coaching and mentoring was happening online made it much more accessible. And I think that's a very strong point. Uh, in fact, I do uh, mentoring myself for a few people and 
as a coach or a mentor mitt for me it made it far easier to do it and increase the amount of activity i got involved in. i also received coaching myself again online and yeah i think that's not going to go away so nadine thanks for raising that point <clears throat> um okay any any questions i'm here for a couple of minutes happy to answer but i would also uh, recommend that you um don't that you have a look at the swap card interface and check out the other things happening today so we've got the future of business education taking place in about 40 minutes followed by uh towards intelligent experiences online proctoring and then that final one with jilly salmon uh, in the afternoon 2 p.m uk time becoming an online human which i think is wonderful i think we may all be online humans but perhaps uh we are not doing it quite well enough and i think perhaps we could be more human online <clears throat> okay, Julian says, do you foresee a, a lift in the role of universities in preparing the workforce? That's, a, that's an entire a shift, sorry, a shift in the role of universities preparing for the workforce. That's a huge question. I love it. Um, I'm just trying to think of a quick answer because that's really a whole day's conference. <clears throat> yes, is the answer. And I think it will depend on the structure of universities where you are there will always be a role for the face-to-face -face university course with particularly highly recognized universities like oxford cambridge harvard and so on bologna they will not necessarily change the way they do things because they don't have to what they offer is a badge that is people having attended a particular university but in terms, if I can just look at that question, in terms of preparing the workforce, yes, absolutely. There will be a shift towards smaller qualifications uh, being provided by all third, sec, third party, sorry, all tertiary education institutions. Now, I say tertiary education institutions because I want to include particularly community colleges in the US. So community colleges in the US do a good job of uh, helping people get into work and they'd offer two-year degrees well i think we're seeing them increasingly offer much more specialized diplomas which are shorter but are absolutely targeted at in your phrase julian preparing the workforce i completely agree but it will also of course be the case that those high perceived high quality institutions that have very prestigious brands will offer and of course currently do offer um, short certificate. So you can, if you live in Malaysia, do a course with Oxford University that takes you uh, a few weeks. And why wouldn't you? In the middle, <clears throat> we're going to see, because uh, community colleges really serve the local community in the US. The, the prestigious uh, institutions can serve anybody in the world, and they will. In the middle, we will have universities and other tertiary education institutes offering services throughout the world which are increasingly specialized why wouldn't you go to barbara oakley i, don't, I can't remember which university she's at in the states but she's a fabulous professor dealing in the science of how people learn why wouldn't you go to the university of brighton for something on creative design uh, and so on or indeed uh, anadolu university in turkey for distance education expertise it's one of the largest uh, universities dealing with distance education in the world. So why wouldn't you go to the university that has people who really specialize and know about this stuff? We will increasingly find that university offerings become, and tertiary education generally offer, offerings, become wider in their scope and more specialized. So there'll be a lot more things you can do, much more focused on particular things, and that will involve universities in a lot more collaboration with government institutions and also employers to make sure that they can deliver training that meets particular employees and particular governmental needs, which comes right the way back to reskilling and upskilling. And I talked about those, those initiatives that are taking place. Well, if you've got a university that wants to make sure it's got funding for the next five years, working with government to meet a particular reskilling need, for example, healthcare in the UK, or um, IT workers in Thailand, for example, then you'll find yourself you'll find yourself much better off for doing it. So I think there are good economic 
and other reasons why, to answer your question, uh, Julian, yes, there'll be, there will be a shift in the role. It will become more specialised, but also the delivery be, will be increasingly international. I think that's probably all we have time for with the Q&A. So I want to thank everybody once again for attending and coming along. Great to have you here. Looking forward to uh, being with you for the rest of the day with the OEB Digital Day here. Well, I was going to say here, uh, <laughs> here in Berlin. I'm not in Berlin. No, I'm in London. And that's the great thing. Wherever you are in the world, the Digital Day is coming to you. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day.